The global lockdown expedited trends that were already in place long before COVID-19. On the retail front, we saw an explosion of online orders, particularly in up-and-coming categories such as groceries and fresh produce. On the office front, we saw hundreds of millions of people working from home for the first time. These people got to experience new tools and new habits. Some of these can stay with them long after COVID is behind us. On the residential front, we saw people experiencing life in the suburbs or in the countryside uh, after many years in the city or on the other side, experiencing what it feels like to be locked in a small apartment in the city and spending a lot of time with their family and basically being at home. I'm sure that this will drive a lot of people to reconsider their priorities, the choices that they've made in life, and also the trade-offs uh, that they've made between the time that they spend with their family, the time that they spend at work, and the hours that they spend every day commuting to work. So on net, I think the biggest impact of COVID-19 on real estate is to make people and real estate landlords as well, realize that they have options. They have options of where to work, they have options of where to live, and there are options in terms of how they manage their time. So a lot of the assumptions, a lot of the things that we thought were inevitable, now we all understand a little bit better that there's leeway within them and we have choices to make going forward. The real estate companies that will win from this crisis are those that learn how to focus on the specific needs and aspirations of their individual users. So historically, real estate was an industry focused on assets. So landlords saw their role as being custodians of a physical asset, making sure that it's in the right place, that it's being taken care of, that it's cleaned properly and maintained properly. It's now being transformed into an industry focused on the consumer, on the end user. Put differently, Real estate historically has been a monopoly game. If you own a little square on the board, it meant that everyone who passed by or everyone who stayed on that square owed you money. So you didn't have to do much other than like holding that square. But now it's becoming something more like a game of chess, where the fact that you own a square is not enough in order to get rent out of that square. You have to constantly think of what people are doing on other parts of the board and respond to them. And that ties into my previous point. People today have a choice. It doesn't mean that they're not going to go back to the office. It doesn't mean that they're not going to live in the city. It doesn't even mean that they're not going to continue going shopping offline. But it does mean that whoever operates and owns those physical spaces now has to convince them to come back. So even something like an office where in the past you just assumed that you own a building in the center of the city, people have to work, they'll come to my building. Today, just being in a good location and having a decent building is no longer enough. And those that will understand that will be the winners. The office of the future is not a place. It's a network of spaces that allow employees to walk in and out of whatever it is that they need in order to produce their best work. So whether they need to work alone and do focused work, whether they need to have a meeting, to socialize with people, to entertain clients, to get inspired or change a scene, all of these different types of spaces should be available to them. And they could be within a single building or they could be spread out in people's homes, nearby their homes if they wanna walk out and spend a few hours working but not commute to the main office. They could be in the main office and they could be on the road. So the role of an office provider in the 21st century is to allow people access, seamless access and easy access to all of these spaces, spaces that allow them to produce their best work and that make them feel better than whatever the alternative is. So we can all work from home now, but still the office has a lot to offer us. It can have better air, better lighting, access to better equipment, better activities, whatever it is that you're willing to pay for and whatever it is that you need, I think landlords will learn to customize their offering to specific people and specific companies in a similar fashion to the segmentation that we see in the consumer world in retail and hospitality. So the same type of consumer awareness is now coming to the world of offices and apartments. I see a lot of people conflating the death of the office with the death of a city. Now, even if everyone suddenly works from home, it doesn't mean that no one will want to live in a city. Cities have been around for much longer than offices and are very likely to survive them. So even if you don't have to go to work, 
you still want to socialize, you want to date, you want to play, you want to meet people, you want to have access to culture. There are many reasons to live in a city. And there are many reasons to pay a premium for living in a city. That said, that optionality that I mentioned in terms of going to the office, where to live, where to shop, applies to cities as well. So people today don't have to live in a city in order to have access to all the stuff that you can buy on earth, in order to have access to really good jobs, in order to even educate their children and socialize with people online and even offline. So cities as well will have to raise their games. They will have to go back to the things that made them great to begin with. They have to become safer. They have to become, to have, to have, to be more walkable. They have to have better public transport that is clean and pleasant to use. And they also need to make it affordable for people to live there, which means on the one hand, more green areas and open spaces that are walkable, but on the other hand, much more density in terms of building so that people could actually have a place to live and not have to be locked into tiny apartments uh, and pay exorbitant amounts of money for it. So we've definitely seen cities attract people before. And I think some of the largest cities uh, have been struggling recently and can raise their game now with this wake up call. More interestingly, I think the biggest battle over the next two decades will not be between the city and non-cities. It will be between cities themselves and even within cities. So one of the phenomenons we're starting to see is people not wanting to commute even inside, let's say, New York and go to the center of the city to Midtown every day in order to work, because that still takes a lot of time commuting and is very unpleasant. They want to be able to work near home, to have something walkable. So Hopefully over the next decade, we will see the emergence of secondary business centers and living centers inside those cities where closer to the great residential neighborhoods, there will be some space that allows people to also work and access all sorts of services in order to ease the impact on the roads, to ease the impact on public transport. And again, to allow people that very walkable and pleasant and healthy and sustainable lifestyle. The second thing that we're going to see is more competition between small cities and larger cities. So. People that live in New York today are not necessarily considering moving to the countryside. Some of them are, but I think the biggest competition will come from smaller cities that are more pleasant, more clean, more affordable, and on the one hand, allow you to have some of the advantages of a big city. So you can socialize with people, you can have access to jobs, but at the same time, don't have the same level of congestion, the same high prices, the same high taxes, and the same social issues that occur in the very, very large cities. I think the biggest positive from this whole crisis was the fact that it really showed everyone that there's an alternative way to live. So it, it really forced us to rethink the way we work, the choices that we make about our homes, the way we spend our money, how much do we even need to spend, and even how pleasant it is or isn't to spend so much time with our family. So people suddenly realize that it's possible to actually spend more than an hour a day with your kids, and some of them might be enjoying it very much, and it'll be hard for them to go back uh, and do what they were doing before. People realize that spending nine hours a day, five or six days a week in the office and maybe another hour or two hours a day commuting, even if you live inside a big city, is just too much of a price to pay, especially when there's the choice. People are also learning that, you know, it's fun to go shopping sometimes when you're looking for an experience. But for a lot of day to day stuff, you can just order online and get it delivered. You don't need to go to the supermarket anymore. So the best thing about this crisis is that really it was a wake up call, both for the consumers understanding that there's alternatives and particularly for real estate, for landlords to understand that they no longer have a monopoly on where people actually go to do whatever it is that they have to do, that they need to convince people to come back. They need to be mindful of these people's needs and aspirations and they need to adapt their offering accordingly.